Hi, folks. Uh, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And recently, I was a invited speaker to the Low Carb USA conference in San Diego uh, in August. And I had the wonderful fortune of sitting with and spending quite a bit of time uh, with a gentleman called Dr. Arthur Agatson. And most of you won't recognize that, that name. If you've heard of the Agatson uh, score, you may. Um, but Dr. Agatson is a cardiologist who works down in Miami, and he is the creator of the CAC score, the Coronary Artery Calcium Score, that is a very useful screening tool now adopted by the American Heart Association in what I think is a <laughs> an upside-down way. We'll talk about that in a second. But the CAC score is a screening score for cardiovascular or vascular injury uh, from plaque. And today I want to explore and give you some education about what to ask for, what to look for, and how to evaluate your um, vessels. One of the other speakers there was uh, Dave Feldman, and Dave is a, an engineer, you all know him as the lean mass hyper responder, crazy uh, engineer that tests himself about lipids all the time. And Dave has a really cool study coming out there, you can Google that. And if you, if you want to enroll in that study, he is open for enrollment now, although I'm sure they've over-enrolled already. Um, but I'll speak about that study. But really what we're looking at is this. The most common cause of death in America right now is coronary artery or vascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, vascular disease, diabetes type diseases. And I'm not going to go in this talk down the lipid, diabetes, that pathway, but whether you buy into the lipid heart hypothesis where fat itself deposits in the blood vessels as a primary injurious event, or whether you believe or, or buy into the carbohydrate uh, insulin model of vascular damage where elevated sugar levels damage the endothelial cells, initiate a clotting cascade, and the fat is the innocent final responder to that damage, it's the fireman trying to put out the damage rather than the arsonist. So the question is whether it's fat is the arsonist or whether fat is the fireman. But it doesn't much matter. Long story short is via either principle, we deposit plaque on injured vessels. And the plaque slowly builds up, especially in our narrow, long vessels like the coronary vessels. The one coronary vessel is the vessel that gives the heart blood. Okay. The carotid vessels are the ones that give the brain blood. So those are the two vessels that are most dangerous for plaque development. The aorta can also develop plaque. Um, those are the three common sites where we see extended plaque where it can cause specific damage. So that plaque is the deposition of lipid, of fat, but the lipid was deposited by the initiation of the clotting cascade. And the second factor in the clotting cascade is calcium. So calcium is one of the factors, one of the uh, things that promotes as part of the multiple constituents of the clotting cascade. Calcium is way up front, and then the, the lipid plaque, the lipid deposition, is one of the last things that gets deposited. Okay? So we've got little bits of calcium, initiate that, and the fat comes and sits down there. So over time, as you repetitively injure that blood vessel, you get more and more deposition of calcium. Now, these plaques are not just accumulating. There's two systems in the body. There's the uh, uh, um, fibrosis pathway or the uh, clotting pathway, and then there's the thrombolysis pathway. So there are certain enzymes and chemicals that lay down plaque. That's called the clotting cascade. And then the thrombolysis cascade is the one that comes along and breaks down that plaque. And this is happening all the time. We're laying down plaque to plug holes. Think about cutting your skin and forming a scab. And then that heals and you form a little scar and you cut it again. So uh, uh, there is response to the injury. And then there's the stuff that removes the scab and allows that to heal. And that's happening all the time. If it's swayed one way, where there's more plaque forming than there is plaque being removed, then it accumulates. Okay? So we've got to understand that. And um, we can measure two things. We can look at two things that, that allow us insight into the accumulation. The chronic accumulation that doesn't go away, the stuff that's there permanently, is the calcium. And it almost looks like 
a little line of bone. It's white on x-rays in the vessels. But that is burnt out plaque that accumulates over years. So it tells us about not about immediate plaque progression, but about plaque over years and years of damage. And then we've got something called soft plaque. And soft plaque is that snotty, I've held it in my hands when I did, op, when I did series on these vessels, um, but it's the soft gelatinous, almost snot-like, looks like old snot, um, soft accumulated muck that sits on top of that calcium layer, and that's the stuff that can potentially break off and go downstream. So that's the earlier form, and that's the part that gets remodeled, so that can come and go, the calcium can't. So that's the general gist, and as these plaques narrow the vessels, Two things can happen. They can shut the vessel off completely so you don't get downstream blood flow. That's a slower process. And early on, you can develop collaterals. So there's like side branches, detours of blood. So you still vascularize uh, um, the tissue downstream. But eventually, enough of that collapse happens and you can have the big heart attack. Um, that's uh, um, uh, uh, called a, um, a pluck. Oh, it's got a word to it. I, I can't think of it right now. I'll think of it in a second. The other thing that can happen, that's called an occlusion, occlusive plaque. The other thing that can happen is little bits of the soft plaque can break off and travel downstream. And where the, where the vessels branch, they form narrowings. And the, the, that little plug called an embolus, embolus just means traveling downstream, can plug. And it's usually this fresh blood clot with a piece of the old snot-like gelatin that plugs that vessel and you get this acute shut off of blood supply, no time to develop the detours of the collaterals, and that's a heart attack or a stroke. So that's the mechanism and that's why it's dangerous, commonest cause of death. And even now in the COVID generation, when you hear of this hypervasculature and people dying of vascular disease during COVID, blood clots, same process, activated, not caused by, but where COVID further damages an already damaged system. Okay, so it is important in all of us to know what our status is. Because what a large part of the ketogenic movement is to drive you toward uh, um, resolving that plot so that your thrombolysis is greater than your clotting cascade. And you get rid of that plot. So how do we measure this? And a very nice screening tool is a simple CT scan that will show us coronary artery calcium. And what Arthur Agatson did is he created a score based on risk. And the score equates with how likely you are to have a heart attack. And if your score is zero, according to Dr. Agatson, there is close to a zero risk for the next 10 to 15 years of having a, coronary, a heart attack from a clot now, the other cause of heart attacks, but from a clot. So a zero score is a really good thing to have. And you cannot have a zero score if you haven't damaged already, damaged those blood vessels with either sugar or uh, uh, nicotine, which is the other cause of that damage. So there are a lot of people out there with zero scores. But as the score increases, your risk goes up. And it's a very, very useful screening, sco screening score. And I would advocate for anybody as a motivation and as a knowledge base to get a CAC score. It's a very simple thing to do. We do them all the time through our office. Now, that is not necessarily the gold standard. That's a screening tool. And the problem with the American Heart Association is they've adopted that to reinforce the need for statins even when your LDL is not that high because LDL doesn't correlate that well with the score. So they now found a different reason an added reason to advocate for statins. That's an argument for a different day. I would use a CAC score exactly the opposite. That even if your LDL is high and your CAC score is zero, we know that you've got a very close to zero likelihood of having a heart attack or a stroke. It's not absolute zero, but it's far less likely that you're going to have one. Therefore, there is no benefit to be on a statin, even if your LDL is high. It's also proof that a high LDL is not associated with plaque development. My CAC score is zero. My LDL is 240. So if LDL caused this problem, my CAC score, CAC score should not be zero. Be that as it may, that's the first test. However, in my at-risk patients, in those patients that have had previous cardiovascular disease, in my hypertensive patients, 
There is a slightly better test to do, a more accurate test. Because you want to look at both the calcium, which is the old scar damage, and you also want to know, which tells you about history, but you also want to know what is my current risk. And there's something called a CTA, a CT angiogram, similar to the CAC score, but here they have to put a needle in your vein, inject some dye, and they do a rapid CT scan of your heart and of the blood vessels in your chest. And the value of a CTA, so there's slightly higher radiation exposure, pretty much like flying from Florida to, to San Diego on a sunny day. So not massive radiation exposure, but the CTA allows us to look at the soft plaque, the non calcified snot-like plaque as well as the calcified plaque. So it will give you a calcium, uh, coronary artery calcium score. It'll give you a CAC score, but it also shows you about fresh plaque, which is the more dangerous one. And if there's a lot of fresh plaque, that is a big concern, and there's specific ways to treat that. It may even warrant um, putting a stent or using a balloon to dilate that. But a CACTA is the next level up and in fact, what Dave Feldman is doing now to look specifically at that point that I made about myself earlier on, he's looking at a group of what he calls these lean mass hyperresponders. These are people who are insulin sensitive on a fastidious keto carnivore diet over a long time. So our keto carnivore veterans who have <clears throat> very low insulin rates, they're insulin sensitive, their blood sugars are normal, but they have very high LDL and they're all skinny. And the question then is whether or not that high LDL is related to plaque. And if they have plaque over the next two years, it's a two-year study, so they do a CTA to begin with and a CTA to end with at two years, is there plaque progression? In other words, is that high LDL, which is measured, causing increased plaque or the opposite? Because if your plaque is going away, or if you have no plaque and you don't develop plaque over two years, that debunks the entirety of the LDL lipid heart hypothesis. So folks, a CAC score is useful. A CTA is even more useful because it's more accurate information, or more not accurate, but more robust information about that soft plaque. There is a radiation exposure. There is the iodine use. You have to have healthy kidneys. So there are limitations, but to my mind, the value versus the risk is enormous, especially if you're at risk. If you're a young, healthy person, probably not a good idea. CAC score is fine. CTA is very useful. The next level up is an invasive angiogram, which is where the uh, cardiologist or the radiologist sticks a needle in your groin into the artery, perhaps even in your wrist or your, or your uh, arm, depending on where they go in, but they actually access your blood vessel, your artery, and they go backwards up the artery to the heart and they actually inject dye directly into the vessel. And the value of that is it's not a static picture, which is a CTA and a CAC score is a static picture. It's like a photograph. Whereas now they can get a video of that vessel so they can see how that vessel is working, how your heart is working. It gives them a lot more information, but it's a very costly, slightly dangerous, invasive test. So it has huge value, but mostly it should be done after, unless it's done as an emergency, uh, if you've had a heart attack or something like that, it should be done after a CTA or as part of a CTA. But the uh, coronary angiogram is, should be mostly considered to be a therapeutic intervention, which is, okay, we're at high risk here, and it's highly likely we're going to need to put a stent or balloon a plaque then you do that because you can then slide in a wire and drop a stent into that vessel. The stent just opens it up, squeezes that plaque and opens it up so you get better flow. Or a balloon where a plaque is about to rupture may uh, squash that plaque so that it opens up the blood vessel. Balloon angioplasty or uh, a stent. And there's ramifications to that because now you have to be on blood thinners. There's a whole bunch of ramifications to that. It is life-saving. It is necessary, both acutely and chronically. Um, I leave that in the hands of the cardiologist. But that's the third step. And it, the intervention should happen less and less as the other modalities are used more and more. And then the other test that a lot of cardiologists love to use is a, uh, a stress test, a coronary artery stress test. So they, they stress the heart. And there's two ways to do that. They can get you to walk around on a treadmill for eight minutes, or they can inject a 
chemical into your vein that causes the heart to accelerate on a chemical basis. And what they're doing is they're stressing the heart, getting it to beat really fast and hard, and they're monitoring your blood pressure, your rhythm, and seeing if there's any segments of the heart that are not working properly. So it is a very valuable functional dynamic test, but it is different to the vascular assessment. And I think one of the things that cardiologists do is that they, they tend to jump to the most invasive because it's rewarding. And I'm not saying that they're just about the reward, but bang for buck, they get more information from those, but they don't always need to do that. So please make sure when you see your cardiologist that they give you alternative options in terms of testing. And they tell you specifically what they're looking for when they do a certain test and what the alternative tests are. I'm not arguing with the tests that they do. There's value to each of them. But it shouldn't be a fishing expedition to see if something's wrong. They should be suspicious of a specific entity and be testing for that entity. Whether it's a rhythm abnormality, whether it's a beat abnormality, whether it's a stress abnormality, or whether it's a vascular structural abnormality. So have that conversation, that smart conversation with your cardiologist. Not that I'm accusing anybody of over-ordering tests or doing the wrong tests, but so that you and they are on the same page of what information you need to make the best decisions about your own body. That's why we do them. If you would like a CT angiogram or a CTCAC score as a screening methodology, as a non-cardiologist, I'm working in this space where the disease likelihood is extremely high in my patient population, I'm very comfortable ordering those two tests as a standard screenings tool. I love the CTA. I love what Dr. Agatson's doing about the CAC score. And the final interesting thing, because it's really interesting to see cardiologists come this way, and I was so, so impressed with Dr. Agatson in my conversations on the sidelines with him. Just such a wealth of knowledge. But even there, somebody who has been indoctrinated very heavily into the lipid heart hypothesis has left that hypothesis and flipped over to understand that the carbohydrate insulin model of plaque development is the truth. And that plaque in non-smokers develops because of sugar and starch consumption, not because of fat consumption. Remarkable that he's been able with confidence to, uh, to make that change. And he has become a very large advocate of a low-carbohydrate lifestyle in juxtaposition to the standard American uh, Heart Association position of a low-fat, low-salt diet. An absolute beacon of a man and helping us within his organization to understand the truth about where the damage comes from. Stay low carb, my friends. I am the carb addiction doc. I hope this under helps you to understand and gain knowledge about how to interact with your cardiologist or your family doctor. But if you want us to order those tests, plus some blood work to look at the uh, aspects of that model, how insulin sensitive or how insulin resistant you are, text us. 561-517-0642. Other access modalities are on the show notes. Just click the little button at the bottom of this. You'll see all the different ways to access us. And if you like this content, these, these videos are free. I have a charitable organization that puts these out. I don't benefit from it financially from these videos. Drop us a few dollars at our Patreon account, Carb Addiction Doc, or send a few dollars to our PayPal account, Robert at Jax, J A X. C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N, jackschildren.com. We spend that money on these videos. Thank you so much. I am the Carb Addiction Doc.